Hey, my friends, it's Brendan Burchard, co-founder of growth.com, and I'm so excited to welcome you to the Growth Habits Show. We're really thrilled to have Larry King interviewing Larry Fitzgerald today for you, and I know you're gonna absolutely love this. Look, we began this program because we wanted to bring to you the voices of some of the most extraordinary people in the world talking about what is it that makes them so extraordinary? What's their mindset? What's the habits that they're doing every single day that you can do? How can you overcome your challenges, your difficulties? How can you achieve your dreams even faster? And we thought, well, yeah, sure, maybe I could interview them or maybe somebody else on the growth team could interview them, but who's better to interview some of the most successful people in the world than Larry King himself? So we've teamed up with Larry to do these extraordinary interviews for you, and I can share with you Larry has been such a dramatic difference maker in my own life. Uh, many of you know my story. When I was a 19-year-old kid, I was in a car accident, and it inspired me to want to live a better quality of life, but I didn't really know how to do that. I knew I wanted to live my life and love and make a difference, but honestly, I just didn't know the path to personal growth yet. And one of the first books I was lucky to read was Larry King's book on how to talk to anybody, anywhere, anytime. And it taught me to be more curious it taught me to ask more questions. It taught me to sort of put myself out there. And so now coming full circle and getting to work with Larry, and I've been interviewed to him a few times. He's interviewed me a few times. That's why we want to bring him to growth, because he does such incredible, insightful, difficult questions sometimes in the interviews. You can see that you're going to get a lot of value out of these interviews. And, of course, as much as he's changed my life, I know you're familiar with his career, too, in broadcast. In this particular interview, we have Larry King interviewing NFL superstar Larry Fitzgerald, fourth all-time records in his position. He's been with the Arizona Cardinals 14 seasons, and he's a 10-time Pro Bowler. Really listen to this. I, I encourage you to bust out your journals and write what comes to you. What are you learning here about habits or mindset that you can implement in your own life? Because sometimes in your relationship you struggle, or in your career struggles, or in just knowing what you want for the next level of your life, you're not clear. And hearing from extraordinary people will help you find that clarity. So bust out your journals and let's join Larry and Larry right now. Today's special guest is NFL superstar wide receiver Larry Fitzgerald. Larry's entering his 14th season with the Arizona Cardinals, where he's amassed over 13,000 receiving yards. He ranks fourth in NFL history in receiving yards per game, been selected for the Pro Bowl 10 times. Off the field, Larry's devoted himself to a variety of philanthropic work, headlining five overseas USO tours, launching his own charitable organization, the Larry Fitzgerald First Down Fund, which helps bring to life positive activities for kids and their families across the United States. Did you know early on you were a good athlete? Yes, sir. I knew pretty early on. You know, I was pretty dominant from six years old. You know, I was always usually the fastest and the tallest and the strongest and the quickest. And that kind of just continue on. Was football your favorite sport early? No, it wasn't, actually. Basketball was my favorite. I really enjoyed basketball. But I always loved the physical nature of football and being able to pose my will on my opponents. How important were early goals? They were uh, extremely important. My parents always put an emphasis on setting goals, not only long-term goals, but short-term goals. And any time we would reach a goal, you know, they would always, you know, um, you know, give me that positive affirmation that this is what it's all about and, you know, uh, you know, celebrate your achievements. And it's something that I still do to this day. Were the goals athletic or more? No, we were always, um, you know, challenged to set goals in many different areas, no matter what it was, you know, if I wanted to, to know the Bible a little bit better, you know, I went to a pilgrim school, you know, grade school, or if it was to, you know, achieve a certain grade on a, on a, on a standardized test, you know, we always set goals. Brothers and sisters? I have one younger brother, Marcus, and uh, he attends the University of Marshall. He also played football, but now he's in pharmaceutical business. So two successes. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, my parents would be very happy, I think, if they, uh, um, you know, look back on it, you know, both the kids graduated from college and doing what they want to do in life. 14 years in a contact sport. You've seen lawsuits about uh, head injuries and concussions. Why do you keep doing it? It's a passion. I really enjoy it. I enjoy the challenge. Um, I really particularly enjoy being a part of something that's much bigger than me. Um, 
Um, you know, no one person on the football field can really determine the outcome of a game in the grand scheme of things. And knowing that I have to depend on my teammates and be able to motivate each other and them get the best out of me, I get the best out of them, um, is really something I enjoy doing. So you never think of, you, you know that in athletics, your career ends when most careers are beginning. Yes, sir. So you, you, do you think you play till you're 40? No, no chance. <laughs> I have no desire, and I know I won't be able to play until I'm 40. But, you know, it's something I've, I've done since I was a child. Um, you know, I looked up to so many wonderful athletes, got a chance to see them playing, and, and it's something that I always wanted to do. And I know it's a small fraction of my life, but the opportunities that football has given me, um, you know, off the field, the people I've got a chance to meet. I mean, I'm sitting here across, across from the table from Mr. Larry King. Now, that doesn't happen every day. Um, you know, so, so some of these opportunities are tremendous, and, and football has opened those doors for me. Do you think you can instill that in other... For example, did you have a mentor? Oh, I had, I had plenty of mentors. You know, Like? Um, I never had to look further than my father. You know, at home, he was the, the model citizen, the man that I, I really, really respect and, and look up to. Um, treated my mother with great respect. You know, he, he, he was the, he, person, he personified um, hard work, dedication, um, commitment to family, all the things that I value. Um, you know, he, he's just a, a special person. And then he would also surround me with other people that I really wanted to be like, you know, Chris Carter, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Kevin Garnett, Kirby Puckett. I can go on and on down the list of guys that I emulated in sports that were uh, people that I could reach out and touch. Did you look at it any time that there was a drawback to being black. No. But you grew up in a society, you know, it's still a problem. Yes, uh, my, my dad's a journalist, a sports journalist, but has been for the last 40 years. Um, his family's from Natchez, Mississippi. My mother's from Louisiana, New Orleans. So um, I, gr I grew up understanding some of the, the issues that we face as, as African Americans, but my parents never allowed my brother and I to look at those as, as reasons not to reach your goals and achieve the success that you now, want. Concerning motivation, do you uh, approach performance and motivation different than when, say, you were at the university? No. Still not. the same? Still the same. So what perseveres? What, what is it? You can't, you can't be better than you were, right? I mean, as you age, you can't get better. What keeps you, what drives you? Well, you have to redefine yourself. As you get older, some of the skills might have diminished, but there's other attributes that are, are getting better. You know, like? I know the game better. I know the nuances, the route running, the techniques, what my opponents are trying to do to me to negate me. Um, so I can beat them mentally now much better than I ever could when I was, you know, say, 20 or 21. So this could apply to whether you're an athlete or not. Yes. As you advance, learn things and use them, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You have to be able to adapt to different scenarios and different changes. Um, you know, about four or five years ago, I, I was looking at some tales. I was like, man, I used to be able to make that catch. Now, now I wasn't able to do that anymore. But there's other things in my game that I can do now that I weren't able to do before because I wasn't um, using the proper technique. I wasn't getting to those spots in the correct time. So, um, you know, I, I like to say I, I've improved. Are you learning all the time? I always learn. I always learn. That's something that's... Um, um, has been very important to me, not only on the football field or athletics, but just in life in general. You know, I read everything I can get my hands on. I'm intellectually curious. I love to travel with different cuisines, you know, so I take that, that same approach um, in everything I do in life. Let's get into your life. What, what do you, what's the first thing you do when you get up? What's your preparation every day? So the first thing I do, I usually get up about 5.45, get up, uh, jump in the shower, brush my teeth, and uh, I go off to work, and um, you know, once I get to work, I usually get a workout in um, before practice starts, get my treatment, and then I kind of do my studying. That's where I kind of get my, my book work in. I learn about my opponent that I'm playing that week, some of the strengths, some of the weaknesses, where can I exploit them, and, uh, and then we go to practice, and, and that's kind of the work day. I usually get out at about 5 o'clock. Do you like practice? No, I do not like practice, but I understand um, you have to practice. You have to prepare to make sure you'll be able to be at your best when it's time to compete. Is there a daily habit that you'll never give up, no matter how old you get, when you're out of football? If I were to pick one daily habit that I would take with me, I think it would be being punctual. Um, mm -hmm. You know, being punctual as an athlete is doing what's required for you to be the best that you can be. Um, that's 
being the best as a parent, you need to be punctual. If you tell your son, no, you can't have that candy bar today, you can't have it tomorrow, you know, you have to be punctual in, in, in the way you live your life. And, and I think that's something that I always will take. So if you say 6 o'clock, you mean 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock means 6 o'clock. Uh, how about in the off-season? How does the ritual change? It doesn't change much. You know, I'm pretty... You go to work out every day? I work out. Um, maybe the time might change predicated on what my kids have going on for their day, but I always get my workout in. And I try to make sure I'm eating right, um, doing the small things that I know that I need to do to make sure my body's prepared. A lot of this, then, is little things, right? It's all about the little things. Have you ever had the urge to quit? Never. My dad told me a long time ago when I was probably eight or nine years old, I was playing on a basketball team. He told me, you can either play for the school team or you can play for the club team. And he gave me a couple days to make my decision. I chose to play for my school team. We were very bad. I think we won one or two games. I played well. I dominated. But we weren't any good. And midway through the season, I went to my dad and I told him, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do this anymore. I wanted to play for the club team. They were much better. And he told me, no, son, you started it and you have to see it through. Um, the first time you quit, it makes it the next time that much easier for you to do. So you never want to get into the habit of quitting. No matter what you do, you want to start. If you started, you have to see it through. Do you, do you have books, music, record? Do you read a lot? I do. I read a whole lot. Right now, I'm actually reading uh, Shoe Dogs, uh, um, Mr. Phil Knight's memoir. I'm really enjoying it. I'm almost uh, done. Nike. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a bestseller. Yeah. Uh, you played for one team your whole career. That's rare in sports these days. How do you explain that? I think it's a combination between the player and, and management. Um, you know, the player has to want to be in the same place for his entire career, and management has to kind of want you to be in the same place for your entire career. And I love Arizona. I love playing for the Arizona Cardinals. Um, our owner and, and, and team president, Michael Bidwell, I, I really respect him and admire what he's been able to do with his organization. And I um, mean, I, I, I believe it's an honor to play there, and, um, you know, it's been a great run. Loyalty important to you? Loyalty is everything. Loyalty is everything. If you, if, you, if you can't find things that you're um, going into business with and people are going to be loyal to you and you're loyal back to them, I mean, what, what really do you have at the end of the day? When we return to this edition of Growth Habits, what's the best piece of advice our NFL superstar Larry Fitzgerald ever got? Plus, how did this 10-time Pro Bowler handle adversity on and off the playing field? Stay with us. We started Growth.com and this interview series because we recognized that people want to become more. You know, that's our tagline. When you go to our website, you see this person standing from this great big mountain, and you can see they're just poised and they're ready. You know, they're ready to accept that challenge in their life. They're ready to listen to that restlessness or that frustration inside that says, you know what? I want to become better. I want to become a better mom or a better entrepreneur or a better leader. I want to manage my health better. I want to get things done more. That there's something inside that makes them want to become more. And that's what we've learned by studying the growth masters of the past. It's very clear that three things lead to an extraordinary quality of life, an ability to achieve you becoming more. Number one is that commitment to excellence. And so that's why I honor you watching this video series right now is because you wouldn't be here if something inside didn't say, I want to become more. I, I want to be more excellent at what I do and contribute to the world. Number two, to achieve more, to become more, to become great, you have to get mentors. And that's what we're bringing to you every single uh, month with these interview series, but also through our Growth Masters monthly program where we bring the great voices from the past, the personal and professional development leaders who really set the foundation for all of us, you know, a Zig Ziglar or, or a Napoleon Hill or Dale Carnegie or Earl Nightingale or Brian Tracy, bringing their voices to you too because we all need mentors to go to the next level. And the third thing we've learned from Growth Masters and for all those who've ever been on that journey to becoming more is that you need better habits. You need better daily routines and rituals to put you back on track to, to becoming more disciplined, more focused, more effective at achieving your dreams and becoming an extraordinary person. This is what we do here at the Growth Monthly Masters Program, and this is what we do at Growth.com. It's your time to become more. We're back with more of our Growth Habits series with the great Larry Fitzgerald. You are known to be one of the kindest players in the NFL. You're known to disarm defenders by bombarding them with pleasantries. They tackle you, you tell them how you're feeling. 
Explain that. Why do you use kindness oh. since your opponent wants to block you from getting the ball, hurt you, not meaning to hurt you, but it wouldn't bother if he knocked you out of the game? Mr. King, I wouldn't say that I... Don't I, say Mr. King. <laughs> say your own name, Larry. I wouldn't say that I really do that. You know, I'm, I'm pleasant on the field, but I don't, I don't go out of my way to, you know... Uh, you know, say nice things, but I'm, I'm kind. That's that's who I am by nature. And, um, you know, that's always how I was raised, is to kind of be a good sport, be respectful, respect the game, most most importantly. Do you hate your opponent? No, I don't hate anybody. I don't hate anybody. You know, that's something that um, I, don't, I don't like harboring those type of feelings towards somebody. You know, somebody would do me wrong, um, I would probably tell them about it. I, I didn't appreciate it, and I would let it go. You know, it's... Um, Life's too short to, to harbor those kind of feelings. I mean, it takes too much energy. It's strange because a lot of athletes, some great athletes, said that they they play in anger. They they want so bad to win that they'll do. You know, that's their. Isn't winning the number one? Lombardi said it's the only thing. It is the only thing. Um, but there's a lot of different eyes. People have their whys and, and, and why they're competing and why they're playing. Um, you know, I want to be great. Uh, I want to do anything I can to be victorious at the end of the day. Um, but I don't want to be that guy that does something that uh, that you can't fix. Um, and that's hurting somebody, you know, um, you know, doing something that would mar my reputation at the end of the day by cheating or doing something like that. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to do that. So you wouldn't want to win a game where you commit an illegal act that the referee doesn't see? No, I'll take a win. <laughs> I'll take a win. <laughs> where did you learn this aspect of being nice to other people all the time? That's something I saw with my mother. My mother, growing up in Minneapolis, she was uh, she founded a few nonprofit organizations, and I saw her her love, her passion for other people and their and their well being. Um, you know, she ran an organization called the Circle of Love, and it was dealt with people who had just been diagnosed with HIV and AIDS, and she was providing resources for them to deal deal with that coping mechanisms with their children. And I saw the compassion that she had for those people. Um, you know, the time, the resources she put into it, and even as a young kid, you know, I saw that 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 required a lot. And uh, you know, I said I wanted I wanted to emulate that and be somebody who could. Um, uh, you know, be compassionate, and, and that's something I saw at a young age, and I, and I try to emulate my mother. How do you deal with negativity and ego people in the workplace, right? You have a lot of that in athletics, especially. <laughs> there are a lot. Um, you know, I, I just, I understand that, you know, some people have, um, you know, inflated view of themselves, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Whatever you need to, to get the best out of yourself, but not something that I, that I do. I don't take myself all that serious. You know, at the end of the day, I'm, I catch a I catch a, a football for a living. That's not changing the world. It's not making it a better place. So I don't take myself all that serious. But you're entitled to. You have to have an ego. Well, first of all, you have to say I'm good. Right? Oh yeah, I believe I'm very talented. Uh, you know, but I, I don't put myself on, on a pedestal, so to speak. I understand that I have a God-given ability, but everybody in the world has a gift. Um, you know, but I didn't, but you also understand there's a supply and demand. Um, and, you know, the world puts a premium on guys who are big and fast and can, and can catch and jump, you know. Are you someone who encourages your teammates? Are you a team leader in the clubhouse? Yes, I always like to use encouragement. Um, I think that's the most positive way to motivate people is by using positivity. Um, you know, you tell a guy he's doing well. You tell a guy he's got great potential. You tell somebody, um, you know, they'll do better next time. Those are all things that they they hear, um, and I think they can build on. That important anywhere, no matter what you do. I believe so. In the workplace, anywhere. I believe it, that 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 resonates anywhere. Anything you're doing, you know, when you're positive with people, you're usually going to get a positive response. Who helped? What the transition from college to pro? Joe Namath told me once, we all in life deal with transitions as we step up. Nobody's bad in the NFL. Mm -hmm. Is it in college? You know, there, there's some bad players. You know, that's the way it works. There's nobody bad. You might be a little better than this guy, but he's not bad. No. Right? So you're around people, all of whom have had met, su met success, mm -hmm. high school, college, and now at this level. How is that? You had to be mentored. Who helped you make that growth? 
Well, I've always been one to seek advice and seek knowledge from people who are doing and are, are and have done the things that I'm trying to do. So, you know, I had a great running back that played for my team when I got there by the name of Emma Smith, you know, the all-time leading rusher. And everything he did, everything he ate, the clothes that he wore, um, the time he came in the building, I tried to emulate it. I said, if the best running back in history is doing it this way, then I should be doing it this way. And I just sat back and I watched him until I had enough courage to kind of go talk to him and pick his mind about some of the things he did. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why did you say that in this interview? And I just tried to emulate the things that I saw him do. And then the next year, Kurt Warner came. And Kurt was another wonderful human special being. Special guy. Special person. Um, a two-time MVP, but a real MVP as a human being. And, and so I learned a lot about how to be off the field and how to carry myself and things of that nature. So I, I was always one that was really, really inquisitive, and I would sit back and just watch people that I respected. Some people say, though, people like Kurt Warner, they're goody two-shoes. Do you live, is, that's a put-down. But mm. they're, they're obviously competitive. Yeah, I, I, what, I've, what I've learned is most people that usually say negative things about you, there's always a smidge of jealousy a bit, you know, behind <laughs> it. Um, you know, if somebody's calling you goody two-shoes, that means that... Uh, they're probably, they're probably not as good as they want to be at something. Do you still have mentors now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. The coach and others? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of coaches that I really respect. Jerry Sullivan, guys who have helped me, you know, immensely uh, around, uh, along the way. And then I have also mentors in business that, you know, now as I transition out of the game, you know, I, I utilize, um, you know, just to help me make good decisions as I, as I make the move. You like business? I love business. I love business. You know, guys in, in, in Phoenix, you know, the great Jerry Colangelo or my friend in New York, Mr. Jimmy Dunn. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys that I really respect and admire, um, not only the way they do business, but how they conduct themselves while they do business. Do you want to have businesses of your own? I would love to. I would love to. You know, I find it fascinating and interesting. Um, it, it's, it's something that I'm passionate about. And I think as you transition out of any um you know, workplace, you need to have something that you are passionate about when you get done with it. You have an edge because of your name and your career, right? I don't know if that creates an edge. You know, I, I know that I have, I know I have a work ethic and I know I'm willing to commit to something and, I'm, and I know I'm willing to work for it. How do you deal with loss? Losing, everybody loses games. How do you deal with that aspect? Defeat and you don't get a chance to come back for a week. Baseball, you come back the next day. Yeah, I, I remember playing the Super Bowl um, after the 2008 season and uh, losing to the Pittsburgh Steelers in, in a last-minute, uh, you know, touchdown catch, and it still haunts me to this day. I don't know. Really? If you, I don't know if you ever get over it. Um, you're able to cope with it a little bit better, but it's it, it's like a scar. Um, it heals, but you can always see it. Do you use it? Always, always. So you take negative to make a positive. I always use negative experiences things that happened to me throughout the course of my life, um, you know, to kind of uh, put in the back of my mind to serve as a reminder. How about unfortunate things off the field? Your mother dies of cancer, right? Mm -hmm. How old was she? Mom was 47. 47? How old were you? I was 19. Yeah. How'd you, how did you deal with that? Not very well. Not very well. Um, you you know, were in I, college? I was in college. I was in spring ball. And... Um, my mother and I had got into a little argument a couple months before that, and um, over over a girl, she telling me that I needed to do things a certain way, and, and you know I was in college now, I was on my own. I thought I could handle it, and I told her, "Mom, let me let me let me be a man, let me take care of it." And ended up probably not speaking to my mom for for three months before she passed away, and um, oh. so it was something wow. that was extremely selfish on my part. Something that I look back and say, I can't believe that I did that. But it also was a, a valuable learning experience for me, um, you know, and how I handle my children, how I handle my father now. Um, you know, now we have a disagreement. Dad, you know what? I, I don't, I don't want to do it this way or I don't like the way that was, but I love you and I'm agree to disagree with you. So it's helped me just handle situations in, in a much better way. Do you feel guilty when she died? Oh, I felt so much grief, so much grief. And still to this day, you know, I, when I think about it, it, it it's troublesome. It, it bothers me that I would be that selfish and um, you know that egotistical that I that I would do something like that. What advice you give to people who experience loss? I 
I personally, I, I needed some help. I needed, I needed some, some grief counseling. I needed to talk to some people that could help me get through it. Um, you know, a spiritual mentor um, in Pittsburgh, Dr. Reverend Curtis, um, who helped me a great deal. Um, so I, I needed some help. I, it, I was struggling. I almost dropped out of school. Um, I almost quit playing sports. Um, I needed I needed some serious help because I, I was. So you needed others. I needed others. Yes. Are you you're a religious person? Now. Yes, sir. That helped a lot. Helped a lot. You know, I, my religion, my religion, my beliefs in the Lord are, are kind of my my rock. You know, everything is turbulent. Everything is going crazy for me, but I know I can always go back to my safe place, and it and it gives me peace of mind, um, it allows me to kind of uh, get to ground zero, so to speak, where I can be on level playing field and kind of get to my, to my roots. After the break, NFL star Larry Fitzgerald on the importance of expanding his career beyond the gridiron and his keys to preparing for a prosperous future. That's next on Growth Habits. So no doubt when you watch interviews like this, you get inspired. You know, you see some level of greatness and you start asking yourself, am I giving my best right now? You know, am I giving my best to my family? Am I giving my best to my business? Am I showing up and showing the world who I really am? Am I exerting my personal power and strength in the world? That's the power of watching interviews like this. And I just say, let's take it to another level. You know, if you haven't heard about the Growth Masters Monthly Program, this is what it is times 10. And let me tell you what I mean, is we've gathered the greatest personal and professional development courses in history, and we put them into a member's program for you to access right now. When you sign up for the Growth Masters program, as an example, you get 50, that's 50 courses right now from some of the greatest personal and professional development teachers in history. This is Zig Ziglar teaching you how to rise to the top. It's Brian Tracy teaching you how to be a better entrepreneur. It's people teaching you how to master your mind, master your health, master your finances, master team, master leadership. It's the mentors and the voices who have shaped my life and so many other great leaders in our industry. It's your opportunity to get 50 courses unlocked right now for just $49 a month. And these are courses that most people paid $300, $400, $500 for. We also give you every single thing we can from our vault at growth.com to help you succeed. From getting you on a phone with a certified high performance coach so you can identify where you're at and where you need to go. You know, it's, sometimes you just have to talk it through with a small group of people. So we put you on a small group coaching call with a certified high performance coach so you can figure out like what should you focus on right now. We give you two tickets to our Growth Summit. That's our live seminar where we bring some of the great leaders of today in to inspire you and instruct you on how to go to that next level. We do things like making sure that when you're in our members area, you can participate with a community of people who are positive and amazing and want to help you go to another level. And every single month we release new training. Five new courses released to you every single month in personal and professional development. Again, to help you with your health or your finances, your leadership, your mind, your body. Really looking at your entire life and making you better. Pulling in some of the great voices in personal and professional development. But also, it's me with you live every single month where I teach you the latest in motivation, high performance, and psychology. And teach you what I've learned. What did I learn from Napoleon Hill or Earl Nightingale or Dale Carnegie or Tony Robbins or or Stephen Covey. What I learned from them, I share with you every single month. And there's Larry, every single month interviewing another great to help you be more inspired just like you have been in this interview. It's all part of the Growth Masters Monthly Program. You can see a link on this page where you can get signed up today for just $49 a month. And remember, these are programs that people paid hundreds of dollars for each. You get 50 unlocked for you right now. Look, lots of people spend lots of money on Netflix or gyms each month, and that's cool. They're paying, you know, to entertain themselves or to get their body fit. But it's time to get your mind fit, to get your mind, your body, your whole life back in alignment so that you can become more, so you can serve better, lead better, achieve more. That's what the Growth Masters program is all about. What is the Larry Fitzgerald First Down Fund? 
I established the first down fund in 2004, and you know, I always remember back when I was a child how many people had a positive impact in my life. I kind of look at myself as a bowling ball going out in the bowling alley, and everybody who's bowled, you know those bumper, bump, the bumpers that come out of the side. And I was that bowling ball kind of bouncing right and left, right and left, trying to get to my objective at the end of the lane. And those were coaches, and those were teachers, and those were other positive mentors. And I wanted to make sure that I was doing everything I could with my platform to foster those dreams for the young people behind me. So what do you do with it? Um, we raise money um, in three different events I do uh, a year for um, nonprofit organizations who are sporting youth. And, um, you know, so we've done work in all different parts of the country. We've done computer labs, technology labs um, in, in my hometown of Minneapolis is also in the Maricopa County, which is Phoenix area. And so I want to continue to, to support the youth. Is it a good idea for young people watching this and people starting out to also get involved in philanthropy to, that you, you gain when you help others? I would definitely encourage anybody um, who's thinking about it to do it um, because when you do get involved in, in making a difference in others' lives, the impact that it has in their lives is tremendous, but the impact that it has in yours I think is even more profound because you find um, – that we all have 24 hours in one day and what you decide to do with it is unique to you. And when you sacrifice your time and resources to, to help other people, it's just uh, something that feels so special. All right, now, you've always had goals. What are your goals? You're how old now? I'm 33. What are your goals now? You're at the brink now, you'll play another three, four years? I don't know if it'll be that long. <laughs> So you're ready to yes. make that move. Yes. What are your goals? I just want to win a tr championship, you know, something that has uh, eluded me. Um, I had an opportunity to play in the Super Bowl a few years ago, came up a little short. To be able to get back to that, um, that platform would be amazing. It's something that I really would like to do. All right, that's the closer goal. Yes, sir. And then beyond that? Long-term goal would be to continue to raise, uh, you know, awareness of my foundation, continue to impact my youth. Um, around the nation and be a positive mentor, um, you know, for people behind me. When did you start thinking about your future? Uh, I'm always thinking about the future. Um, you know, I'm thinking about long-term goals that I've set for myself, things that I want to achieve. Um, and so I, I'm always writing down new things that I want to read about or I'm interested in and, and, and want to learn more about. You left the university early, right? Yes, sir. Was that an okay move or do you ever regret it? No, I, I, don't, I don't ever regret it. You know, I try to live life without regret. I, I think about things quite thoroughly. I, I do my due diligence before I make decisions. I, I don't do anything hastily. Um, so when I do make a decision, it's been thought out, it's been vetted. I've talked to some mentors. I've talked to people that I trust and respect, and then I'm able to make a decision. You know, to leave college as a sophomore, um, you know, at, at 19 years old, it was the new frontier. It was something that I was not ready for, um, you know, but I don't think anybody's ready um, at, at that age. Um, but I knew that it was something that I wanted to do, something that I had dreamed about doing. No regrets? None. You went back and got your degree. I did. How important was that? That was very important for me. Um, it took me, you know, 10 plus years to be able to do it. I did it, um, took coursework online at the University of Phoenix um, in the off season. And now when I talk to my sons about the importance of education, it's not something I'm just talking at them. It's something that I took the time to do myself. And, you know, I made a promise to my mother also that I was going to finish my degree. And, you know, it's something I'm really proud of. I'm, I'm happy I was able to accomplish it. What part does your wife play in this? I'm not married. You're not married? No, Were you sorry. married? Never been married. Are you raising your boys? Oh, yeah. I'm with my boys all the time. So they're with you? Uh, we do a 50-50. Yeah. What's it like being a single parent? I think it's great. I think it's great. Um, you know, obviously it's not the way I was raised, but it's it's the it's the situation I'm in. You know, I do my best to make sure I'm uh, providing my boys with all the knowledge they need, um, the resources they need to be able to reach their goals. Also, are they athletes? Yes, my oldest Devin. He's he's an athlete. He loves to play sports. Favorites football, but he excels at pretty much all the sports that he does. A little one, he just turned four, Apollo. Um, you know, he's not into sports yet. He <laughs> loves the Legos and technology right now. So we'll see how it goes with him later on. What do you make of the technology world we live in? Um, Are you a habitual on your phone? 
Um, I do text message and email, but I do enjoy having conversations, face-to-face conversations with people. I think it's a lost art. You know, I always harp on that with my sons, you know, communicate with people. Put the phone down, put the technology down, let's let's, let's talk over dinner. How was school today? And, um, you know, I, I think there's a time and a place for it, but, you know, you need to be able to have those interpersonal people skills. Yeah, what's wrong with talking? Nothing. There's nothing wrong with talking. Another, These another, kids are all into another loss. Uh, another lost trade, I think, is, is being able to write. You know, my grandmother. I remember writing me all the time, and I writing her back. And you know, being able to have that dialogue, I think, is important too. So I, I harp, I harp on that with my guys also. Are you strict? I wouldn't say I'm too strict. You know, there, I have some things that I'm strict about, um, but I wouldn't say overall I, I'm too strict. Does your seven-year-old watch you play? Oh, yeah. They both come to every single game at home and a few on the road. I let him pick a game he likes to come to. So last year, he loves, he loves Cam Newton, so he came to Carolina. Mm-hmm. Then he came to our last game here in Los Angeles last year. So there's a few games on the road I let him come to, as long as his grades are good. Now, if he loves Cam Newton, he's not rooting against his father, is he? No, I wouldn't say he's rooting against me, but he, he loves the dancing and he loves, you know, how big and fast and, and, and strong he is. And, you know, so he... He, he, he picks a certain night. He loves LeBron and, and, uh, and Kevin Durant, you know, guys like that. He, he, he always a big fan. Many of our viewers might just be beginning their careers. So what's your advice for those entering a new job, a new field, a new perspective? What do you say to those men and women? I will say what my coach told me when I first got in, got in the league. He said, God gave you two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen two times more than you talk. You need to learn. You need to learn from the mistakes of the people that came before you so you don't make those same mistakes and you're able to find and navigate your way a little bit easier. So you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to follow the lead of, of others that came before you. Will you say you were able to keep that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm still that way. You know, I, I love learning. I love seeing the experiences of others um, and, and learning from it. Like my motto is I never learned anything when I was talking. Yeah. <laughs> I like <laughs> Think that. about that. I like that. How important is networking? Networking is... Are you good at that? I, I don't know if I'm good at it, um, but I, I enjoy doing it. I, you know, just getting the chance to meet new people in all different walks of life. It's, it's a lot of fun to hear the stories of other people and hear their paths and their successes and their failures and, um, you know, just being able to listen to it. Doesn't your entree help you or is it, could it be a negative I think it helps in terms of the introductions, so it, it allows you to... Got a foot in the door. It gets, gets your foot in the door. But I think it also hurts you because people pigeonhole athletes. They, they you know, this is this is their field, this is what they do. Um, I don't know if that um, has any parallels. I don't know if it can translate to other things that you may have interest in. So I, I think it's a good and a bad thing. Do you still network despite your experience? Absolutely. Heading into your 14th year in the NFL, how's your outlook changed? How do you look at what's changed about your approach to the sport, what you feel about it? I work a lot smarter now. I think as you get older, you have to be able to find out what your strengths and your weaknesses are. You have to be able to work on your weaknesses while maintaining, while maintaining your strengths. And I think I've been more efficient doing that as I've gotten older. And I think that's why I've been able to play at a high level later on in my career. And no matter what you're doing in life, you have to find that balance. You have to find ways to be able to motivate yourself and continue to raise the bar um, in, in whatever profession you're in. The only constant is change. That is true. <laughs> How do you deal with change? I embrace change. Um, I try to make sure that I'm, I'm comfortable with change, as comfortable as one can be, because you know it's inevitable. You know there's going to be changes you know, in your personal life. There's going to be changes in your professional life. Um, but you have to be able to understand that and be able to cope with it when it comes. Now, if you look back at young Larry Fitzgerald, 19-year-old Larry Fitzgerald, leaving the University of Pittsburgh, do you ever pinch yourself over everything that's happened to you? <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't say pinch myself. I, I'm more of a guy who I, I critique myself a lot and decisions that I've made, things I would want to do better or handle better. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hard on myself in that regard because I expect to be great. You know, I want to be great. I desire to be great. And so I hold myself to a high standard. What aspect of the game is hardest for you? As I got older, I would say the physical nature is, is, is tougher now. I mean, you don't, you don't bounce back like you used to when you're 20 years old. Um, <laughs> hits hurt a little bit 
more. The, ru the runs are a little bit harder, but... As you look back, anything you'd have done differently? No, I wouldn't change anything. You know, I think every experience and every hard time and every good time, you know, it's kind of shaped me into the man that I am. Um, so I, would, I wouldn't go back and change anything. What will you tell viewers the difference between being good and being great? I think at times, great can be an enemy of good. Uh, I think when you're doing Expect something, more. when you, I think there's a, there's a there's there's a there's a level where people get to who are really really great, um, you know, start to hurt themselves when they're in their pursuit of greatness. You know, I look at example, you know, a guy like Tiger Woods. I think the greatest ever, and I think his willingness and pursuit of being greater than great already, you know, hurt him a, a bit. And I think that sometimes can, that can play into it. I'll tell you a story that you might appreciate. Paul Warfield, a great wide receiver yes, for the Miami Dolphins, the unbeaten. I spent a lot of time with Paul, a brilliant guy, Ohio State. Yes, uh, one, he never jumped up and down when he caught a touchdown pass. Never. He handled the ball to the referee. He said, because that's what I'm supposed to do. Yes, sir. So he didn't do acrobatics. But he said, I asked him once the difference between good and great. He says, there's a lot of wide receivers in the National Football League. They're all fast. They all can cut. They all know. When I line up at the line of scrimmage, whether we're going to run a running play up the middle or a reverse Statue of Liberty or I'm going out on a slant or I'm going deep, I always line up the same way. I give no indication of anything else. Because the minute I start to anticipate what I'm going to do, that defensive back will know something's different. Do you ever think, like, do you always line up the same way? No, I change, I change it up all the time. Oh, so you do the reverse. Yeah, I, I don't ever um, like God to pick up on tendencies. So just in the opposite way of Mr. Warfield, he does the same thing all the time. I like to change it up because you never know what's coming if you keep it different. Um, so both can work. Both are, both are effective. Okay, and as we say goodbye and thank you for this very much, what habit would you say has gotten you the furthest in your career? Say the work ethic. Work ethic. I think no matter what you do in life, when you work hard at it, you're going to get better at it. And I think that's when um, something that I've always saw from my mentors and, and the harder I've worked, the more success I've had usually. And you've never lost that because of your success. You never yeah. stood on laurels. No, you have to work harder the more successful you are because you become the hunter when you're coming in. And as you rise to the top, you know, you become the hunted. So you have to be a little bit more work. You have, you have to work a little bit harder. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much, Mr. King. Can't just say Mr. King. That does it for this edition of Growth Habits. Thanks to our guest, Arizona Cardinal star Larry Fitzgerald. We hope his habits for success can make a difference in your life. I'm Larry King, and we'll see you next time. All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Larry King and NFL superstar Larry Fitzgerald. I want to share with you now sort of my five takeaways because I watched it too. I wrote down on my journal all of my insights, things that really inspired me or, or helped me think about my own next level of performance and potential in my own life. You know, look, I, I've been doing high performance coaching now for 20 years and I've been blessed to work with Olympians or NFL superstars too or, or everyday people just trying to go to the next level. And what I've always found is when you hear a story like Larry Fitzgerald's, you realize that no matter where you're at, no matter what you're trying to do, you can grow if you believe in yourself. And if as you believe in yourself, you maybe take a few things from the mentors around you to develop even faster that's what I really got from this interview. And I wanted to share with you five specific things that really inspired me from Larry Fitzgerald. Number one, if you remember, right at the beginning of the interview, he said that he loved football because he wanted to impose his will. I think that's incredibly powerful. Today, so many people have that, you know, that victim mentality. It's easy, you know, and it's the struggle out there. You're trying to make more money, take care of your family, do something amazing. It's easy to kind of just go with the flow or even give up. But if there is one thing we know at the center of all personal and professional development, you need to take command of your life again. And when he's talking about imposing his will on the game or on his competitors, he's saying he's not going to go out there and just take what he gets. He's got a plan. 
and he's going to take command of his life and his reactions. You know, I tell people all the time, if I look at your calendar and your calendar is completely dictated by other people, then we don't have enough freedom in your life. Many times changing your life begins with taking back control of your own agenda. You know what I mean? Because it's easy to just be reactive to the world without imposing your will. Like, what do you want for tomorrow? What do you want to make happen tomorrow? What do you want next week and next month? And you can't just hope that it comes together. You have to each day impose your will because if you don't impose your will on what you want, other people will make you get what they want. So impose your will again. Decide what is it I want now at this stage of my life, at this stage for my family, at this stage in my career. And then impose your will by showing up each day and working hard for it, not getting distracted on everything else, staying focused and persistent, Impose your will like Larry Fitzgerald talked about. Number two, he loved challenge. You know, we just finished the big research study for high performance habits, and we found out that this is one of the critical mindsets of all high performers. They love challenge. They don't back down from challenges, and they don't just accept challenges in their lives. And what I mean by that is, if the only challenges you're facing in life right now are the challenge that life is throwing at you, you know, the difficulties of the life, the, the challenges of making it and taking care of the family or, or going to the next level in your career. If the only challenges are the ones that just kind of happen to you, you're not yet consciously designing your life. The challenges you have in front of you today should be significant ones you set for yourself. You know, like lots of people do at New Year's. They say, here's what I'm going to do with my year. And then they forget. And then they just, they're dealing with life. And I know you've been there. I've been there too. What we have to do, though, to go to another level is to start not only loving challenge when it comes up, honoring the struggles that come with challenge, knowing and anticipating that when we go for higher levels of anything, any new goal, it's going to be really hard, and to be patient and honoring of that process, but also to consciously design our goals. I mean, I think it's important that you set up a habit in your life that every single week you sit down and say, what's a challenge I'm setting for myself this week? Even if it's something that's already there. You know, today, while I'm filming this, I also happened to be interviewed by Larry King today. And I said, you know, I want to, uh, for me personally, I want to know when I have that interview, I want to challenge myself to share with a little more sort of, sort of, I guess, confidence than I usually do, which is a hard thing. It's hard to will yourself into confidence, but that was the challenge I set for myself. Now, I don't know if I did a good job, but have you set a challenge for yourself in something that you're doing this next week? Maybe you've, you've got date night coming up on Friday night with your girl, and you go, you know what? Uh, on Friday night, I'm going to make it really fun. I'm going to challenge myself to make sure we don't talk about work and we just have a great time together. That's just every day challenging ourselves to become better, to live a better quality of life. That's the second thing I got from the interview. Number three, Larry Fitzgerald talked about the importance of team. No one person wins the game himself. No one person is capable of becoming extraordinary by themselves. And I think we live in a world right now because so many people are focused on personality or, or what we look like or, or what our Instagram looks like or how many followers we have. We start believing that we're supposed to be self-made. And I always love to tell people, I've, out of all the networking I've done in my life, I've never met, never met a self-made millionaire. Because when you talk to people, the humble ones, they would never say they were self-made. Uh, my example. I... Uh, you know, I was lucky to achieve a lot of financial abundance early in my life, in my 30s. And I would never say I was self-made. I had an amazing high school journalism teacher. My dad really inspired me. There were a couple people in my first job who gave me a break, even though I was an idiot. <laughs> you know, there were people who supported me along the way in little ways. Maybe not, no one handed me a big check or a big job offer, but I, I made my own way in some ways. But it was the people around me that helped me get up there. But what I didn't realize until, I, I, I wish I had earned, learned it 10 years earlier, was to set up the team in your life. You need to level up your peer network. Level it up. Meaning, find a greater quality of people to hang out with. And I know that sounds judgmental, but we also know there's a lot of negative people in your life who you could spend a lot of time with. Or you could start building bridges to new and positive people. A lot of people say, well, Brennan, I have no one to support me. I have no one who believes in me. My family's jerks, you know, and they're struggling over and over. And I say, hey, look, try this. Start volunteering. 
go volunteer because when you volunteer you meet extraordinary people and when you meet extraordinary people you're inspired by them but many of them can become part of your team they can become your cheerleaders they can become your door openers they become the linchpin of someone who now teaches you exactly what you need to go to the next level you've got to have team supporting you whether that means as an entrepreneur you hire that first virtual assistant you just just pull the trigger and do it get an assistant or that means now you know you've plateaued in your revenue now it's Time to hire those next 10 marketing guys. I don't know what it is for you, but you need to have a team. If you're a stay-at-home parent and you're just struggling, it's time to get some support there too. Because the longer you put off developing a team, the longer you put off your full potential. The fourth thing I got from Larry Fitzgerald was this idea and importance of mentors. He talked a lot about people he looked up to in his specific field of endeavor. And he watched them, he modeled them, he learned from them. And you have to do that. You know, uh, for me in my own career as a, as a writer and a speaker and a trainer and a coach, I had people in different areas that I really paid attention to. As writers, I, I watched Paulo Coelho. He wrote The Alchemist, which is now the sixth most read book in the history of the world. And I, I followed it and learned everything from him. And then I, I, I got to finally work with him, ultimately. Uh, in, in interviewing or communication to camera, I watched Larry King for... I don't know, a decade of my life, like obsessively to, to see like, how does he talk? And I'd never, you don't have to try to mimic your mentors, but learn their strategies and see how you would apply it. You know, on my stage speaking career, I'd, I'd watch Wayne Dyer or Marianne Williamson or Tony Robbins. And I could never be like them, just like I could never be like Larry, but I could learn some of the things they were doing and then apply my own unique personality to that. And I think of too many people they don't have somebody to follow and model. And if they do, they try to be that mentor. I don't want you to be the mentor. Like, I, I shouldn't try to be Larry King. I shouldn't try to be Tony Robbins. I never could. These guys are unbelievable legends. But I can say, what is it that they're doing that I could now model and bring my own unique personality to? So what I'd love for you to have is a list of five mentors like that. Think about your career. Think about your life. Identify five mentors like that and then actively be following them and asking yourself, what are they doing that I can try in my own way? What are they doing that I can try in my own way? What are they doing that I can try in my own way? And the last thing I learned from Larry Fitzgerald, which I really loved, he said that he redefined himself as he aged. Remember, Larry asked him, he said, you know, you're, you're, you're older now. You're probably never going to be as good as you were when you were younger. <laughs> I mean, what a tough question or statement, right? But Fitzgerald handled it great. He said, hey, look, uh, yeah, but I, I've learned different aspects of the game and where I could play and really and make my difference. But he said he's redefined himself. And I think it's important for all of us at this time in your life, in your career, in your family, to redefine what do you want now, my friend? Maybe you got the job or the house or the car. Maybe you got the graduate degree. Maybe you got the certification. Maybe you had the first couple wins. It's always a good time to sit down and seek clarity for what is it you desire now? Who are you going to be in the next five years of your life? Like this next phase, like if you're in a moment of transition right now, however you would define that, what's the next phase of you? And if you don't define that future self, then you'll just end up being mediocre because we have to have that future vision of ourselves that pulls us into wanting to develop and wanting to become better. It might be a good time to redefine yourself. I hope you enjoyed some of these takeaways. If it is time to redefine yourself, I would love to tell you about our Growth Mastery Monthly program. I mean, if you like this, you will love Mastery Monthly. Every single month at growth.com, we bring to you legends and we talk about what made them great. And we do that in several different ways. One, you get these, you get access to Larry King's interviews with some amazing people, just like the one you saw with Larry Fitzgerald as part of Growth Mastery Monthly. But you also, when you sign up, what we've done is we partnered with Nightingale Conan, which is really the world's leading provider of personal development materials. And when you sign up for Growth Mastery Monthly today, you get access to 50 audio courses in personal development like right now when you sign up 50 audio courses because you know what sometimes you're wandering around listen to the, you listen to this podcast you read that blogger you follow this person on that feed and you really if you really think about it you've left your personal development to sort of randomness and if your personal professional development is always left to randomness 
You always live in a land of mediocrity. You, you need a plan. And we've structured the plan for you. So when you sign up for Growth Masters Monthly, we give you 50 courses right now that you can take at your own pace anytime. Download them on your phone, stream them on your phone anytime. And every month we unlock five new courses. These are courses in the areas of wealth and business. These are things in the course of health. These are in mindset. These are in setting up the right habits. But they're from the legends in personal development. Look, I'm talking about people like Zig Ziglar. I'm talking about people like Earl Nightingale, Jim Rohn, Les Brown. I mean, the greatest of the greats. We have their audio courses, and we're releasing them to you in Growth Masters Monthly. When you sign up for Growth Masters Monthly today, we also give you two tickets to our next Growth Live seminar. Come to a seminar where it's me and, and, and uh, Trent Shelton or Dean Graziosi or Larry King or Harvey McKay teaching you about personal development so you can network with other achievers in a live situation because you and I both know sometimes you got to get to an alive seminar environment so you can have that transformation and that change in your life. And to ensure that happens for you, last thing, sign up for Growth Masters Monthly today and when you do that, we'll give you a free group coaching session so you can get on the phone with a certified high performance coach. This is somebody I've personally trained and certified so that you're on a group coaching call where you go around, Rob, and you talk with other people and you discover what you need to do right now. Because sometimes that's the hardest thing. Like, what should I do now to, to grow, to, to earn more wealth, to become better or healthier? This dialogue-based conversation in this group coaching call, we'll give it to you for free too. So just sign up for Growth Mastery Monthly right now. And here's the deal. If at any time you don't like it, Cancel. Cancel the subscription. I mean, it's just like, you know, uh, Netflix, but instead of just doing it for entertainment, you do it for education and empowerment. So many people have a, a monthly subscription to their gym and don't go, but a lot of people, they think, yeah, maybe I will go for it. And they're pushing themselves. They're going for CrossFit or they're doing some real physical activity and they're paying every month for that. But they never set up a mind gym. They never set up a monthly program to keep them at their best to help them stay at the razor's edge of success, to help them really go to a new level. Uh, I mean, we all can just kind of bumble through life. But if you're ready to have a real curriculum and a real set of guides and mentors, the people that Larry interviews, then this will change your life. And if any time you don't love it, cancel. But every month, we're going to roll out five new courses for you. And the last thing is, every single month, I'll go live with you too. So it'll be kind of like this, except where I am able to take your questions and do some coaching with you all as well. And I'll always be sharing my latest personal professional development expertise as I get to work with some of the world's highest achievers. I want to share with you what's possible. And I know sometimes you can't do it yourself. So if you've been looking for a mentorship program, if you've been looking for ongoing personal professional development at the highest levels, then we're here for you. Click the button down below and sign up for Growth Masters Monthly today.